Hello students and welcome to your lesson on parallelograms. There are two objectives. First, to prove and apply the properties of parallelograms and yes, you heard that right. We are going back into proof, so we will be doing some proofs this unit. And second, use the properties of parallelograms to solve problems. Okay, uh, hopefully you, you looked this up already for your defi definition sheet, but you should know a parallelogram is a quadrilateral. So four-sided figure with both pairs of opposite sides being parallel to each other. The symbol that you can use when writing about a parallelogram is just a small parallelogram, just like we use a small triangle to name triangles like triangle ABC. We would name a parallelogram with the symbol and the four corners. And then to draw one, you are going to have a parallelogram and you're going to indicate the parallel sides. Okay, so by putting on those, the arrows, that indicates that the sides are parallel. And that will always be the case, hence the name parallelogram. Okay, we're going to learn some theorems to learn these properties. Now, these theorems, while they may be true about parallel, parallelogram, sorry, do not define a parallelogram. Remember, it's just, it just means they have opposite sides are parallel. But based on other properties, theorems, definitions, postulates, we can also say the following about parallelograms. So 6.3, if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its opposite sides are congruent. Okay, opposite sides must be congruent. And there's abbreviated forms of these different theorems because there's not names, but you can, when writing in a proof or in some other situation, you can just abbreviate it by, by this statement right here. And then an example um, of how you would talk about the opposite sides being congruent would be if JKLM is a parallelogram, okay, so that means if its opposite sides are congruent, we would do the markings this way to indicate congruency. Now they're still parallel, but they're also congruent. And then the way that we would write that is we would say, okay, segment JK is congruent to segment KL. And we can, oops, I'm sorry, that was incorrect, not KL. JK, whoops, JK about that, huh? JK is congruent to ML, okay? And KL is going to be congruent to JM. So that's how we would write. 6.4. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its opposite angles are congruent. So just like its opposite sides are congruent, its opposite angles are also congruent. And there's an abbreviated form for that. And then the way you would draw that, right, how we indicate congruency of angles. So opposite angles, right, opposite from each other. So K and M are opposite and J and L are opposite. And then how we would write that with our angle signs is we would say angle J is congruent to angle L, and that angle K is congruent to angle M. Next we have 6.5. Again, if quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its consecutive angles are supplementary. And so when we're talking about consecutive angles, we mean one right after another. So if I start at one corner of the parallelogram and go around, these are consecutive angles, okay? L and M are consecutive, M and J are consecutive, JK consecutive, KL consecutive. So if there are consecutive angles, they're sup or I'm sorry, the consecutive angles are supplementary. So remember, supplementary means it adds up to 180. So if we were to just label these angles, we know that J and L are congruent. We just talked about that in theorem four, and that Y and M or I'm sorry, K and M are congruent. We just talked about that. So if I give them the same labels inside, and I can do that because I know they're congruent, then I can say X plus Y equals 180. That's what supplementary is. They add up to equal 180, and that will happen all around it. Okay, theorem 6. If a parallelogram has one right angle, then it has four right angles. So just if one is right, all four have to be right. 
and hopefully you recognize what shape this would make, right? If it's a parallelogram, then that would make it a rectangle, or it actually even could potentially be a square, because it could have um, all four sides be the same. There's, there's no specification against that. But if one angle is right, then all four are right. And the way you can just notate that is just by putting one right angle. That, that lets you, uh, you know that all four have to be right. Remember, a right angle equals 90 degrees. And so you can just say then that angle K, angle L, and angle M are also right. You could also say the measure of each equals 90. Diagonals, we talked about these in class um, the other day. Remember, a diagonal, they, it connects non-adjacent vertices, or, or you could even think of it as non-consecutive vertices. So the red lines are different diagonals. Now, more diagonals could actually be drawn than I have shown. I just divided into triangles. I didn't keep going. Okay, so some theorems about parallelogram diagonals. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its diagonals bisect each other. So remember, bisecting means to cut in half. So we have AC is a diagonal in parallelogram ABCD, and DB is also a diagonal, and they meet at point P. So if the diagonals bisect each other, that means AP is going to be congruent to PC, and DP is going to be congruent to PB. Okay, because the way they bisect each other, if they bisect, then those two segments have to be congruent to each other. And we can write that as AP is congruent to PC and DP is congruent to PB. Now, notice on this, AP and PB right here, they're not necessarily congruent. It's that these were bisected. This line, this segment AC was bisected, so it's been broken into half. P would be a midpoint of both segments. Okay, um, and our final theorem, 8. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then each diagonal separates the parallelogram into two congruent triangles. And we learned various methods earlier in the year to prove congruency in triangles. We had SAS, ASA, SSS, um, or some of the ones that we learned. Um, so if we think about this, we learned earlier that opposite sides are congruent. We learned that in the first theorem I taught you today. So we know that AD is congruent to BC, and AB is congruent to DC. We know that from theorem 3 that I shared in the beginning. And we know by the reflexive property that DB is going to be congruent to each other. So by side, 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 we can prove this theorem to be true, okay? And the way that we would write this is we would say triangle A, B, D is congruent to triangle. And let me talk about something actually real quick. Remember, A is congruent to C, okay? So when I, re when I write the triangles congruent to each other, I have to start with C here because that's the one that's congruent to A, right? They're both in the first position, okay? Is congruent to C, D, B, all right? And then, so if I go A, B, okay, that's the side with the double hash marks, so C to D, the side with the double hash marks, and then on to the third side. All right, uh, watch the next video for some practice problem help.